Hello. Hi, Elizabeth. Sorry for a couple of minutes uh, behind. No worries. No worries. Mostly, you're mostly on time. Um, and yeah, I think we will basically just hand over to you. So you're here to give us um, a talk on research integrity, which is a very, That's very right. important not just for microbiologists, I guess, for all scientists, but, you know, certainly for microbiologists. And, you know, while we celebrate microbiology today and microorganisms, we must make sure that we're studying them in a way that actually gives us real knowledge, right? So That's I'm right. going to let you um, begin and I'll get out your way. All just right. Just make sure you share your screen and I think it will all be fairly straightforward. All right. Let me get that going. And let's see, I find my right screen. All right, there we go. Maybe, can you give me a heads up if you see the right screen that looks like a presentation? It's still loading, that's, I'm, I might be stopping my video to give, give myself a little bit more bandwidth. Okay. But it's in the way, let's see, present, there we go. Is that loading for you? It is loading and I can see the first awesome. slide. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, no, so I'll, maybe I'll, I'll let myself stay on and so you guys can see my face, but give me a heads up if, if there's a little bit of connection issue because I'm presenting from my parents' home in the Netherlands. So my connection is a little bit slower than I usually, uh, that I'm used to. So just making sure that you guys can see and hear me fine. All right. Um, so let me start by saying that I sort of have this dual personality in science. Um, I am, uh, from, you know, from training, I'm a microbiologist. I, um, did my PhD in the Netherlands, which is where I'm presenting from now. Um, and I worked 15 years, um, in academia at Stanford and uh, worked two years in industry. And it was always, it always had to do with microorganisms or the microbiome. And so I started a blog called Microbiome Digest, which is still running, not now by a team of volunteers. And it's a, just a little plug here. I, uh, we have at that website, we have a daily compilation of papers that came out in the microbiome field. So it's everything about microbial communities, not only in humans, but also in plants, in uh, in animals, in the environment, um, and sometimes some COVID uh, papers or some microbiology in art. So we try to make it interesting for a lot of uh, people with a lot of different backgrounds, but it's all about the microbiome. And it's basically a list of daily papers, but we sort of sort them um, into categories. So you'll, if you're interested in plant microbiology, you can find your favorite papers there. And we try to post things that are less than a week old. So we try to be up to date. But I've also um, uh, became interested in science integrity. This started sort of as a strange hobby. I started uh, reading about, micro, about uh, science integrity and specifically misconduct. And as anybody who likes a good detective story, I got hooked because some of these stories are very juicy. They're about fraud. They're about um, lying and cheating. And, uh, you know, that's very interesting. But I also became interested in the sadness about these cases and just in um, sort of finding these cases. I started by searching for plagiarism and I gradually became more interested in finding duplicated images, as you see a couple here on, the, on this uh, starter slide. Um, but also it got me to think in broader terms about why do people do misconduct and, and what, you know, how harmful is it for science? And I got more and more passionate about it. So at some point I just decided to quit my job and, and do this full time. And so it's an unpaid job. I do some occasional consultancy, but uh, most of the work that I do online, you might know me from Twitter. Uh, I'm at Microbiome Digest without the E. And um, the work I present there and in, on my blog, Science Integrity Digest is, is um, most of that work is unpaid, um, but I feel now that, I, now that I have the freedom of not being employed that I can do a lot more than when I was employed. And I hope to make a difference for science, even though I'm not employed by a university or a company. 
So that's a sort of an introduction on the work I'm doing. And um, if you think about why science misconduct is important, for me, the central uh, sort of theme that I see is, is that scientific publications are the way that we're measured. That's sort of our output. We, um, we see um, science papers as, as sort of a measurement for our success. And that is true when you're, whether you're a graduate student or a postdoc or a professor, you will always be held accountable for the numbers of papers that you publish. Maybe you have to publish roughly a paper a year, or maybe your group has to publish 10 papers a year. Usually you'll feel the pressure that you have to publish an X amount of papers per time unit. And if you don't do that, if you don't publish papers, that means you might not get a letter of recommendation, you might not get an appointment as a professor, you might not move on in your career, you might not take that next step. And so all of us, in, in, at least in academia, will feel this pressure to publish. So it's called publish or perish, that's a, the motto. If you follow the university motto, you'll do fine, but else. There's always a threat that you might lose your job or not get that promotion if you, if you don't publish. And so even though all of us feel this pressure to publish, uh, not all of us will move into the dark side of science, into doing misconduct, into faking results. Most of us can handle this pressure. And even though we have to put in crazy amount of hours, which is not good, but we do that because we, we, we are passionate about science. Um, so we can mostly handle that without resorting to uh, doing misconduct, but some people choose to cheat and to, yeah, to, to fake results in order to get that promotion or that uh, letter of recommendation. So that is sort of the setting the tone. And I, um, even though I don't uh, uh, obviously approve of misconduct, I do feel a little bit of the pain and the sad stories that are sometimes behind these things. I'll, I'll maybe touch a little bit more upon that in the rest of my talk. But I, I very much realize, even though the work I'm doing might seem fun and uh, juicy and uh, very interesting, and uh, all those good vibrations, there's very sad stories about each of these behind each of these cases. There's people who uh, wanted to. Uh, thought they had a great idea and were convinced that they were going to get uh, a beautiful paper and then they were scooped. Or there's people who were, uh, had some very promising results and had a, a, a very nice position, they became professor and now suddenly the experiments don't work anymore. Or they might work in a, in a lab where the professor is maybe a bully and really asks that uh, of them that they publish and or else they will lose their job and the, the PI will hire another postdoc. And so people are sometimes in very desperate situations and that is the motivation why they do science misconduct. And I'm, again, I'm not approving science misconduct at all, but I, I'm um, sort of sympathetic in a, in a sort of sense of, of the motivations that are behind these cases, but I will not stop uh, and I will not look the other way. I will keep on finding these papers and and um, flagging them on, on websites or reporting them to journals. So as I said before, why am I so motivated to do that? Because I do see publications as the building block of science. When we are working in science, when we are uh, thinking about our next project or when we are writing a paper, we'll do a literature search and we'll look at papers and we will see what other people have published before us. We base our research on these previous publications. And if you think of science sort of as a uh, hundreds of years old uh, continuation of knowledge and building upon the, the previous generation, you can think of science publications as, as, a, as a big wall built of bricks in which each brick is a publication and um, every generation of scientists lays these foundations of bricks and then the next generation lays another foundation of it. And if you sort of picture that uh, in front of you, then you can also imagine that if one of those bricks, one of those publications contains falsified or fake data, data that is not true, 
then the next people who are building their work upon that publication might actually not be able to replicate it. In other words, if one brick is not really strong, the layers uh, of the wall on top of that might actually also tumble down. And so the reason I'm passionate about uh, science publications and science misconduct is because I uh, realize how much time people can waste trying to replicate results that are fake. And science should be about finding truth, not about finding fake papers. And uh, fake papers sort of pollute science and, and, and hinder science and its progression. So having said that, I know that most scientists are hardworking and honest. And I uh, I'm convinced that all of you are in that category. Uh, I'm obviously working on finding people who are maybe not honest and uh, might not do hard lab work, but might actually fabricate results. Um, and I don't want you to walk away from my talk and think, oh, all science is flawed and all scientists are dishonest and I cannot trust any paper anymore. That is really not what you should be thinking. I'm just focusing on a very small section of science, which I think is, um, should be uh, cleaned up or should be flagged or should be, uh, we should make others aware that this is going on, but it's not applicable for all, all science. But science is also not immune to dishonesty and fraud, like in any other field that you can think of. If you think of banking and, con and construction um, or any other uh, uh, type of profession or field, there will be dishonesty and fraud. That's not to say that, uh, that everybody in that profession is fraudulent. Um, and similarly, science is not immune for that either. Um, so I've worked on many different types of science fraud, like I've, I've worked, I've dealt with predatory journals and fake authors, fake peer reviews. Uh, there's conflicts of interest, there's lack of patient consent. And then there's really the dark side where we're talking about the true definition of science misconduct, which is one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication. And this is according to for example, the definition by the Office of Research Integrity, which in the United States oversees all research that has been funded by the National Institute of Health. So ORI, the Office of Research Integrity, defines science misconduct as one of these three things. But you can also extend science misconduct to the things I've mentioned in the previous bullet points, like uh, conflict of interest, where, for example, uh, a paper uh, gets published in uh, or a paper gets published on a particular uh, result or a particular drug but the writers the authors of that paper are working at that company and of course they will tell you that their product is great and if then the peer reviewer is also working at that company you can see there's a clear conflict of interest and you should not trust that paper or at least that it's it's of high concern and so there's all kinds of things and where they technically don't necessarily fall under the definition of science misconduct as defined by ORI, but uh, I will also work on some of those cases. So plagiarism, obviously you are probably familiar with that. That's, tech, that's copy pasting somebody else's text, but it can also be um, uh, including copy pasting somebody else's ideas, which are much harder to prove than textual similarities. Falsification, is where somebody does an experiment but changes the results a little bit or maybe leaves out an outlier like you can see on the cartoon on the bottom left um, where well fabrication is completely making up results so a way of looking at it is where falsification is an experiment happened but you change the results and fabrication is no experiment happened you just made up the results so that's sort of a working definition and sometimes these two are not easy to distinguish because you can do one experiment and also pretend it's a second experiment, which sort of seems to fall in between these two definitions. So science misconduct is not a black and white uh, distinction because basically science misconduct, research misconduct is sort of this slippery slope. And I've, I've put some things here on this slippery slope sort of roughly going from not so bad to very bad uh, on the right. And that's not to say that one is 
you know, I just put them sort of in a, uh, a in a particular order. Uh, but these are some things you can think of, and you might think, ah, oh, that's not too bad. Uh, that's okay. That's acceptable. But then the next step might be a little bit, uh, you know, less seems to be less scary to then move a little bit farther. And before you know it, if you if you don't talk to yourself and sort of slap you back up on the the ramp, you might actually end up at the bottom because it becomes easier to do fraud every time you can push the boundary a little bit farther. And I want to make everybody aware that uh, most of us might have done a couple of things at the top and and then move back to the sort of the the zone of uh, honesty. But um, it, it becomes sometimes easier to to move farther to the right. And just as some examples, you can think of changing contrast or uh, I've done uh, an experiment where I did an, uh, I made a calibration curve for um, some, some dilution, some maybe some uh, uh, PCR, uh, quantitative PCR, for example. And then you make this beautiful calibration curve and there's this one outlier that just doesn't fit. And I, I don't know what I did wrong. Maybe I made it wrong dilution or so. So I redid my calibration curve and then it looked fine. Um, is that, that's not misconduct, obviously, but it's sort of this starting the slippery slope of like, uh, I didn't like the experiment. I redo, uh, let's redo it. But I did write it down that I re redid it and why. And I just was not sure if I had made the right dilution. Maybe I was just not paying attention. And one of the dilutions was just completely off. And uh, so I redid it and then it was fine. So I, I, for myself, I sort of um, justified this by, because I wrote it down, I didn't hide it. I didn't try to uh, make it go away. I, I was very honest about it. Uh, but I, I, it did feel a little bit bad and I was worrying, I was going down the slippery slope. Uh, and so here I am working on research integrity. And I think all of us are in this position where we do little things that are you, you hide some bad experiments. And it, I think as long as we realize that this is bad and we don't hide it completely, we take notes in our lab books and we uh, maybe discuss it with somebody else who is more experiment, experienced, then it's okay. But, but you can sort of see where it might actually also become easier to then move to the next level. So I just want to point that out that there's a gray zone sometimes where all of us sometimes go into, but as long as we go back into into the lines, then it's um, it's okay. But you can think about things like where you have a blot and you cover up an A-specific band by a, a patch of gray. Uh, that's maybe not a good thing. Or where you don't want to do a control and you just take the photo or the results from a previous experiment. Or you change the value to make it a little bit higher or lower so that it either falls below the cutoff or above the cutoff and your experiment now becomes uh, statistically significant, for example. Or uh, to the really, really bad things where people uh, have a microscopy photo and just copy paste a couple of cells or bands um, to make it look like there's more cells or there's more bands or the bands are at a different height, for example. So that is clearly not good because that's Photoshopping and that is making up data. And, and then the complete extreme is where you completely make up data. You don't even do the experiment. You just make a graph and say that that is what you measured, but it never happened. So this is the slippery slope of, of uh, science misconduct. And so um, I assume that all of you have maybe ventured a little bit on the, on the top left, but hopefully no, none of you have gone all the way down at the bottom of the slope. But there have been several cases where uh, people have uh, have been um, doing misconduct and have been caught by doing, and they, they that ended up in retractions of their papers. And here are four cases that have been in the news a lot. And this is to show you, this is not specifically microbiology, although the first one has some links to that, but just some four famous examples that some of you might have heard about or uh, read about. and um, they are showing that this happens to, uh, to, to people all over the world in all kinds of fields. So the four examples that I chose are from, uh, the first one is from Madison, where uh, in, uh, in the UK, Andrew Wakefield uh, wrote a Lancet paper in 1998 
in which he claimed that there, he had 12 patients, uh, 12 young children who received the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, MMR vaccine. And after receiving the vaccine, they started to become, uh, to, to have symptoms of autism as well as some gastric or intestinal complaints. And other people somehow knew that this data was not completely true, that some of these children already had autism-like symptoms before they received the vaccine, or some of the pathology reports of these children had been changed. And so it appeared that Andrew Wakefield or some of his uh, other authors have changed results, so have um, falsified some of the results. And this paper, after back and forth discussion for 12 years. It got retracted in a couple of years later, 12 years later. And even though it got retracted, and even though many other papers have come out later that showed that there was no correlation between the MMR vaccine and autism, people still believe that vaccines cause autism. And that's based on this paper that got retracted. It's based, in my opinion, on misconduct. and it has far reaching results and children have gotten measles uh, and they had not been vaccinated and maybe that's a result of this paper. And so this is one of the examples that keeps me motivated to, to find papers like these. And, um, but I realize very much that even though papers get retracted, they still might have far reaching results. There have been other cases as well in physics there was the case of Jan Hendrik Schoen, who worked in the US at Bell Labs in the field of semiconductors. And he um, fabricated results. So he made up data and uh, he made some mistakes. He made a, he published the same graph twice in two different papers and somebody just noticed that. And um, after a long discussion with his uh, bosses and people at Bell Labs, an investigation was started and it was found out that this person never did those experiments. And so um, they retracted several of his papers and by now he has 32 papers um, that uh, are retracted. And uh, in Japan, there was the case of Haruka Obakara and she worked at the Riken Institute and she claimed that she could make differentiated cells pluripotent again by just dipping them in an acid bath. And that sounded too good to be true. And it was indeed too good to be true because people noticed that some of her figures had been previously used by her in a lab meeting or some presentation at a conference for to represent different experiments. So they recognized the photos and they said, oh, but she used those photos before and then it was a different cell line. And so, um, her pap two papers in Nature got retracted. This actually happened already, uh, I believe, after six months or so, pretty fast. And then she was offered to repeat her experiments by working under supervision for about nine months, but she was never able to replicate her results when somebody was watching what she was doing. And then in the Netherlands, where I'm presenting from, there's the case of Diederik Stapel, who worked in psychology. He was a professor at Tilburg University, and he made up most of his data. He actually handed his data sets over to a graduate student and says, oh, just write a paper. But his graduate students and other people in his lab became suspicious because they never saw their professor go and do research. Uh, he had all these beautiful results. He claimed, for example, that he interviewed several school classes, but they never actually were allowed to go with him to do the interviews. And uh, they didn't believe really that the results were true. And so they became suspicious, they reported him. And in the end, he actually admitted that he, he made up all those studies. And he has, he's in the leaderboard of Retraction Watch. Um, if you like stories like that, I would recommend that you follow retractionwatch.com they have stories behind retracted scientific papers and they're very interesting to read. So he is in the leaderboard of that website with 58 retractions. So I was not involved in any of these cases, but I'm sort of doing similar work. Um, I specialize in finding duplicated images. So it would be similar to the Haruko Obakara 
case um, because that is sort of what uh, what people found out about her work and how they discovered that the work was um, falsified or at least parts of it. And so the work um, uh, I'm doing is looking at photo photographic images or figures in biomedical papers. And the reason that um, I, I'm doing this is because apparently I, well, I think everybody has some talent to seeing that all these images are different from each other. You might see uh, microscopy photos that look sort of similar at first glance. They're black with a uh, green fluorescent cells visible, but all these panels are different. Uh, there's photos like these from Western blots where you see dark black bands on a lighter gray background. But you can see that each of these bands has a different shape. There's different shapes, there's different curvatures, different uh, gray values, different um, thickness of the bands, there's dots and spots and things like that. So you can tell that each of these panels look different from each other. And then there's microscopy, photos of tissues. Uh, there's more tissues here that have been stained with um, monoclonals for certain proteins, or there's other fluorescent photos. And some of these photos might look quite similar, but there's differences. And in this case, it's actually time series, so they're supposed to look very similar to each other. But the human eye brain combination is pretty awesome because we can see that all these photos are different and that's fine. That's what we expect because in biology, photos and uh, tissues and cells and, and, and anything we make photos of is unique. Like faces, like every rock is different, every leaf is different. We don't expect things in nature to be exactly the same. So we can see when they are. That is a very unexpected finding. Um, here are some of the examples of image duplication that I have found. Um, here on the top left, you see uh, a bunch of panels uh, that are, these are bacteria that were stricked on a Petri dish and their photos. And so you can see whether or not they grow, some grow very thick, some do not grow very well. And even though these are sort of similar photos, they're expected to all look different because they're all different bacterial streaks. But I found two pairs here, mar marked by me in red boxes and blue boxes here. These two sets of panels, these, two, uh, these four photos look um, identical to their paired other uh, photo. So I will usually say these are more similar than expected and that is sort of code for these look identical to me. And uh, yeah, we don't expect that. And you, you know, th these are what I call simple or um, uh, type one duplications. That it's the same photo that is used twice. Then here I have two examples of what I call type two duplications in which we see uh, an overlap between photos. Uh, for example, here, the two areas marked in green or in blue, these are four photos of cells treated with different amounts of radioactivity. And we expect these to be four independent experiments and yet we see overlapping parts of the photos. And uh, here we see something similar where we see um, two overlapping uh, Western blots uh, that differ in two lanes, shift the two lanes to the right, but they represent two different cellular locations and two different proteins. So we would not expect these Western blots to look the same. And yet these two panels marked by me in red are identical to each other as far as I can tell. So these two duplications are not the same as the, the one I showed previously. They're not the exact same photo. It's a, it's, it is the same photo, but it's shifted or rotated or moved a little bit or zoomed in out or a little bit like that. And then type three duplication is shown here. And these are photos um, of Western blots again. And you can see that some of the lanes look identical to each other. Mark, these two are marked by me in blue. And um, if you look carefully, you can see all kinds of little spots that are, um, yeah, those, those lanes are not expected to, to look the same. These are photos of a whole blot, and yet they look identical to each other. And here in the bottom row, row D, you can see three lanes that look identical to each other. And the, it appears that this photo has been manipulated 
So, so I don't know why, but uh, these three lanes are visible, or th this particular lane is visible three times, while in reality, that cannot be, that cannot have happened. Uh, I cannot think of any other explanation that, that this has been photoshopped. You can also see a splice here, but that's not even the worst problem. Um, yeah, so this is what I call type three duplication. And if you, again, uh, recapitulate everything. This is type one, type two, and type three. You can imagine that type one is most likely to be an honest error. Type two is somewhere in between, and type three is most likely to be done intentionally. Because you can think if you don't label your photos really well, maybe you by accident grab the same photo twice. Here, I'm not sure if there's any reason, any accident that could explain this other than human manipulation after the photo has been taken. So sort of this was a useful distinction because I turned my searches, which I did sort of in my spare time, um, I turned this into a scientific project. So in my spare time, um, after working in the daytime on my research, in, at night I would uh, search biomedical papers for duplications. So it became a very strange hobby and I did this for many years. And in the end, I had scanned 20,000 papers <laughs> because I, when I do things, I do them sometimes a little bit too intense. And I um, scanned them in 40 different journals for 14 different publishers. And I, uh, those papers were published in a period of 20 years. Up with Arturo Casadeval and Farrick Feng, who are both uh, famous microbiologists, and uh, they were sort of were in my field, and they had together already published a lot on things like retractions and uh, falsifications, but they had not really heard about image duplications. And at first, they didn't quite believe me that I was finding these things, but then I showed them some examples, and they became very interested, and they became great mentors, and they helped me a lot uh, turning my strange hobby into a scientific paper. And so in the end, I found in these 20,000 papers that I scanned, I found 800 papers with duplicated figures. I have to say that these figures were duplicated within the same paper. So it could be like I showed you in the previous slide within the same figure, but it could also be that figure 1A looks very much like figure 3B, for example. So the duplications had to be within the paper and they also had to be inappropriate, as you can see in the title, which means uh, that if a photo represented the same experiment, then that was okay, that's appropriate. But these photos were representing different experiments. So that's not okay, that's inappropriate. So those were sort of the rules. And uh, the 800 papers in 20,000, that's 4%. So 4% of these papers um, uh, contain these types of photos. And another rule, that uh, we that I applied is that the the paper had to have at least one photo, uh, and if it if a paper only had line graphs or tables or things like that, it didn't count. So I all these papers had at least one photo, and um, because we had these three types of duplications defined: simple type one, repositioned type two, and altered type three. We that was very helpful to sort of answer the question that how many of these papers, how many of these duplications were done intentionally? So basically the, the old question um, the, that there's no good answer to is what is the percentage of misconduct in biomedical papers? And, uh, and many people have made some guesses and of course we only made uh, a very rough estimate, but because we had these three, three types and we know simple, let's say that's an honest error. Altered, let's say that's always intentional. Um, and then repositioned is somewhere in the middle. Then roughly, because these things were roughly uh, distributed equally over these three categories, roughly half of these papers or so 2% of these papers might've been done intentionally. Again, this is a super, super rough estimate because uh, there's many caveats. Uh, for example, we, uh, I, you know, I, I scan these things by eye. I probably have missed a lot. And if it's a good Photoshop, I would not find it. So maybe the percentage is higher. 
On the other hand, you can say, well, these are only the ones with you enriched for papers with photos. So maybe the percentage of duplicated photos is probably in the end, if you count all papers, it's much lower. But you could also then again argue for the other side and say, well, um, it's fairly easy to see a duplicated cell in a photo, but um, how about an altered value in a table or a line graph? How easy is that to spot? And there the answer would be that's almost impossible to spot unless you sit next to the person doing the work. But just by looking at the paper, you would not be able to see a well-fabricated data set. If, if it's a smart fraud fraudster, you cannot catch them very well. I can only catch the really dumb fraudsters, to be, to be honest. Most of the examples, you're like, they're laughable. You can, once you point it out, it becomes fairly easy to see. So if I had to make a guess what the real percentage of, of uh, fraudulent papers would be, I might actually end up between five and 10%, like much higher, which is very high if you think about the amount of papers that get um, published every day. You could also argue then that means that 90% at least of the papers is, is, is okay. So that's, it's, it depends on how you, if you consider the glass half, half full or half empty. Um, and again, this is a rough estimate. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Uh, this is very, uh, it's, it's really hard. You cannot really ask authors that you do misconduct because who is going to answer that honestly? Uh, no, nobody. So it's, it's hard to make a guess, but my best guess would be between five and 10%. So um, of course, this is a, a virtual talk. So I cannot really see you guys or, or ra have people raise hands or be in a discussion with you guys. But I want you to look at this photo, which was represented in a scientific paper as uh, these are microscopy tissue sections, so very thin sections of tissues from mice that had been treated with different conditions and they have been stained with different antibodies to, um, to bring out different proteins. And that's a very long description of saying that each of these panels should look unique. Uh, there should not be any two panels that look like each other. They're from different mice, they're different proteins, they're, uh, they should all look slightly different from each other. And yet there's lots of overlaps. And so I will typically stare at a photo and I'm like, hmm, these photos, you know, I see some blue and I see some brown and I see different colors. But I do notice that, that this row, all these photos look sort of very similar to each other. Would you expect differently treated mice, so different mice, individual mice would all, they would not really look that similar to each other. And so if you stare at these photos long enough, you might start to see some overlap and maybe you have already spotted a couple of overlapping panels. But let me show you what I found after um, spending some time on this photo. I have marked it like this. So boxes of the same color, for example, these two areas marked here in bright green, they look identical to each other. And these are actually supposed to show different um, antibodies from differently treated mice. They should never look the same. And you can spot um, these red panels also show a lot of overlap. And then there's this purple panel. If you look at this two, these two brownish shells here, you can see them here and you can see them here and they, they just keep on coming back. There's, there's another overlap um, in, in this panel that I even didn't see, and I only saw after giving this presentation a couple of times, I noticed that. So there's tons of overlaps here. And even though this is type two, I think this has reached a point where, you, where I would not believe the authors when they would tell me, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. That's, that's too many mistakes. If you make this many mistakes in your science paper, <laughs> then, then I, I'm not going to trust the rest of your, your uh, administration. Then you just have not really kept track of your photos very well. So uh, this is your daily reminder that you should label and work on your lab books and uh, make sure that you can, 10 years from now, you can still understand what you did on that day and make sure to label everything uh, diligently and uh, never make, try to not make mistakes like this. But this is so... There are so many overlaps here. I would not believe this, anything in this paper anymore. That's like beyond, you have ruined my trust at this point. So, uh, well, I've already showed you this, so I'm just going to 
show this uh, again, but here the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, so this paper that uh, I already showed you where the, where the overlaps are, this, is, this was published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection. And um, this to me looks uh, again like a type three duplication and with almost no chance that this has been done by error. So I reported this to the journal in 2014 and I sent reminders in 2016 and 17. And the author said, okay, thank you. We'll look into it. And they never did. So we're now six years later, this paper is still out there. People will still cite these papers. People will still believe this paper is the truth. And I, I'm frustrated about this because I reported this paper uh, the official way and the journal did not seem to care. And that is frustrating because we, we put trust in our journals and we um, like the editors in chief to take action if a person like me, even though I'm just an outsider and, and maybe a nobody, but like I report this, like this seems so obviously photoshopped that I'm disappointed that, uh, that the journal did not respond. And this is the case in many of the papers I've reported, not just this one. I've reported those 800 papers that I told you about previously in around 2014 and 15. So five years later, 2020, I have a fairly good idea of what those journals did with the 800 papers that I've reported. And um, only one third of these papers have been corrected or retracted. In a case like this, I think an appropriate action would be retraction. I would not trust anything in this paper anymore. But if it's an honest error, you could give the author the benefit of the doubt and address it with a correction, which is still good for science because you'll mark the, the paper will be marked that there was some, an error in it and you should look at the figure like this. Sorry, we made a mistake, it can happen. But two thirds of the papers that I've reported have not been acted upon. They're still out there, they're still uncorrected. And that is sad. And that is why I'm taking things sometimes to social media and I write blogs about that because I'm worried about conflicts of interest and inertia in, in scientific publishing. And um, it's good that people discuss these things. So here's another example of a paper um, in infection and immunity that I reported and it had lots of duplications and uh, within a figure or a cross figure, there was also duplication here. And this is one of the rare cases where I feel the journal, which was infection and immunity responded really well. They retracted the paper. And this was actually also reported to the Office of Research Integrity. And it was uh, recently reported that this was uh, indeed misconduct. And the person, the author who published this has been uh, accused of uh, recklessly falsification and fabrication images etc cetera, etc cetera, not only in this paper but also in several NIH R01 grants which is a big deal lots of money and this person is now under four year of submission of um, supervision so they can only do their research when they were they're supervised by a person I'm not sure how strict that is I don't think somebody will really sit next to them but um, you yeah this is one of the rare cases where I feel uh, this has has an, has had an effect, and this uh, th there's a punishment. It's not unreasonable. It's not this person wasn't put in jail or anything. They can still do research, but they will be need to be supervised. So this feels fair, and uh, and and justified, and the right action. So I've worked on many other cases in microbiology as well. Um, this is a case where. Uh, that has nothing to do with image duplication, but it's one of the cases where I sort of do a post-publication peer review and write a blog post on this. So this was a paper in which the author, the single author claimed that the HPV vaccine caused, basically caused um, infertility in women. Now that sounds very serious. So HPV is a, vac is a virus that some, some of the serotypes of HPV uh, can cause cervical cancer and also anal cancer and all kinds of other like throat cancer. It's a sexually transmitted disease and it's devastating. And it's most women are checked for that every um, 
every other year, every four or five or six or eight years, depending on which country you live, women are checked uh, in their, uh, when they have a pap smear, they're checked for the presence of cancerous cells in their cervix. And the, the disease is caused by a virus and there's now a vaccine against it. And it's actually one of the very rare cases in which a cancer can be prevented with a vaccine because it's caused by a virus. And it's all nice and beautiful. And now young uh, boys and girls are vaccinated against this virus with the hope of decreasing the amount of cervical cancer and saving lives. That's all good, but people, this woman claimed that the vaccine itself caused infertility, which is alarming, obviously. And it was based on this research she did in this group of 800 people who got like a questionnaire, she claimed, or 700 people. She claimed it was 8 million, but it was actually only 700. But here's, here's, a, here's the thing that nobody noticed this. So she looked at the HP, women who received the HPV and women who did not receive the HPV vaccine. And she looked at their pregnancy rates. Um, but the thing is that she only looked at women aged 25 to 29. That's actually, it's even in the title. She's not hiding that. But nobody noticed that um, you, you know, a lot of women don't get children until a later age. And that is actually correlated with having a college degree or not. So here's a map of the US, which was not in the paper, in which you see the average age of the first pregnancy uh, or birth, I should say, of women without a college degree, which is much lower than if they have a college degree. Basically, if you, if you go to college, you get children at a later age, which is not surprising. But um, the average age, if you have a college degree of your first pregnancy or your first child is 30. So if you, if you only look at these, these young women, um, the older women uh, are excluded. And you can see that people with a college degree have children at a later age. So, and that again is then confounded with whether or not they received an HPV shot. So it's this very complicated uh, cluster fork in which uh, having a, a college degree or not, an age and having the age at which you have your first child, as well as receiving an HPV shot or not, these things are all correlated. And if you leave one of these out, you can draw the wrong conclusions. So it's, a, it's called a confounding factor. And it seems that she maybe deliberately left out these older women and of course, then the HPV vaccinated women who on average have a higher amount of college degrees, they didn't have their first babies yet. And so it doesn't cause, the vaccine doesn't cause infertility. If anything, it's associated with college having a college degree or not. But these babies, these women did not have their first baby yet. And so it's, I, I wrote a whole blog post about how this paper should not have passed peer review and it's now retracted. But there's so many websites that use this paper as the claim that the HPV vaccine causes infertility. It's, it's horrible and it's scary. And it's, I'm, I, I can, you can hear I'm mad about this because this is, these, this is false information and it will lead to women uh, who will die of cervical cancer, which is now not completely, but partially preventable by getting the HPV vaccine. And then people will accuse me of that. I will that I must be paid by the HPV vaccine business. I'm not being paid by anything. Uh, I wish I was paid, obviously, by by somebody, but I'm not being paid. I'm just here to hopefully save some lives and and fight against false information like this. So, of course, now COVID nineteen happens and brings along a lot of new papers that have been hastily published and hastily peer reviews and there's all kinds of things for me to work on and I'll be, uh, you know, I, I've been as busy as ever uh, and busy, busier than ever, I should say. And one of the cases I've worked on is uh, a paper, a very famous paper now, by uh, the group of uh, DJ Raoul in France. And Raoul and his group uh, claimed that hydroxychloroquine resulted in a dramatically decrease of the presence of the COVID-19 virus, SARS, um, uh, the, the SARS virus, the coronavirus. Um, and he, um, and if you look at this graph, it looks great. Like, oh, yeah, all these people who are being treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, uh, they cleared the virus. 
but there's there were several things wrong with the paper and i wrote a blog post about that um one of the things is he left out two patients who died in the treatment group he didn't include them and so that seems to be you know leaving out the results you don't want which would count as fabrication if you would do an investigation to see if that is really what has happened and it's a very small group of patients there's there are many other things wrong with it it was peer reviewed in one day it was published in a paper in which one of the authors was the editors in chief and so there were several things that were not good and um, this paper of course was heavily discussed but it was also backed up by the u.s president the united states president uh, and he he claimed that this this hydroxychloroquine was the new uh, saver and would prevent COVID-19. He also claimed he took it himself, et cetera. And it was just based on a small study. Um, and then there was on the other side of the equation, there was a paper that proved supposedly that hydroxychloroquine actually did not help at all, but actually caused more disease and uh, specifically heart um, uh, cardiovascular diseases. And that paper was based on a huge data set that then turned out to also be falsified and a paper got retracted. And I looked into one of this, uh, these authors and I found that he produced this beautiful artwork during his PhD. And in this paper, he claims that he's looking at um, rodents inner ear structures, which look remarkably like Melba toast, but um, yeah, they seem to be photoshopped. There seems to be some lots of repetitions going on here. And so um, there's, there's lots of work for, for me with the hydroxychloroquine and I've both, I've worked on both sides of the uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, the pros and the cons. There seems to be misconduct on, on both sides and lots of retractions and that it's eroding the trust of the public in science. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide because we're going to be close to the uh, the end now. And I'll talk briefly about paper mills, which is another project that I've worked on as part of a team of other people who do similar work like I do. So we're a group of whistleblowers, if you will, but some of us, like me, work under their full name and some others work under pseudonyms for various reasons. So I didn't do this work by myself, but it was, I'm here just to talk about it, but I do want to give credit to those people who Worked, um, worked on this paper mill like Smut Clyde, Cheshire, uh, Morty, um, and then Jennifer Byrne and uh, several other people, uh, Jana Christopher um, and Tiger. So it's a mixture of pseudonyms and real names, uh, but I want to give credit to, to the work they have done. So we found this set of 400 papers that all had the same background. These have, if you compare these panels, it's a Western blot panel, and I've increased the contrast a little bit. If you, if you focus on particular regions, you can see that the background of each of these panels looks remarkably the same, which is hard to explain because it's noise and it should be random. Um, and then if you look at the bands, they, they sort of seem to float on this background. The bands are all different, uh, but then these backgrounds are the same. How, how can you explain that? And then we found not only these similarities between panels in the same paper, but we also found them across papers. So there were multiple papers that had this exact same background, even though they came from labs in different places, in different cities, in different provinces. And uh, that became bigger and bigger and, and, and more astonishing by, by every paper that we found out. So now we are, I think we're actually close to 500 papers now that all have the same background. And, the only reason you can think of is that these photos are artificially produced by what we call a, is a paper mill, which is some commercial entity, maybe a company, that sells papers to people who need a paper for their, for their career. And uh, there's another pa paper mill that I worked on where uh, the same photos were used or same photos, but slightly differently zoomed or, or rotated. and. If you put them on top of each other, it's all the same photo. So that's a set of 120 papers, also from all different laboratories and, and uh, different, uh, different groups of authors. So there, there's no overlap in the authors or hardly any overlap. And they were probably fabricated uh, by the same company who is selling these papers for money. So 
That brings me to the last slide. And I want to point out again how much the cost is of science misconduct. It's not only damaging for, for scientists who do this and, and don't only think of the people who, who do this themselves, but the other authors on these papers or the other people who work in these labs who get dragged into these cases of misconduct and whose credibility might also suffer even though they didn't do misconduct themselves, but their names are on the paper, uh, on that paper, or they have worked in a lab that, that did this. But it's also damaging for science as a whole because um, if people read about these cases, they might start to think that science is broken and that all science is, is not to be trusted. And I don't want that to be the message of this, this uh, talk uh, because I'm, I'm fighting against it. But it, it's easy for a non-scientist to think that if there's misconduct in science, then we, we cannot trust anything anymore. And that, uh, that, is, that is, I think, incorrect, but I, I can see why people think that. And in a, a situation where we are now with a pandemic, we want, we want to people to trust in science. And, and um, it's a scary situation because there, it seems that scientists are less and less believed. And I think that is going to have great and severe consequences for our health and um, our environment as well. I've touched a little bit about why do people commit, uh, <laughs> commit science misconduct. This is a, uh, a question I've uh, already talked a little bit about. There are sad stories about it, uh, behind it, and not involving just them, but, but their whole environment and labs. And one of the examples I gave is that, for example, an, um, the atmosphere in a lab could very much determine whether or not a person commits suicide. Uh, I keep on saying it's wrong. I apologize. Uh, why they uh, commit science misconduct. And that is, um, it could drive people to do uh, bad things. And uh, the reason I bring up, want to bring up um, that uh, people have taken their lives is that in some of these cases, there um, people have, who have investigated these uh, cases of misconduct or who have been accused of misconduct or who were part of a team or a mentor of somebody who did misconduct, uh, they did take their own lives. And I'm very aware of how sad these stories are. And uh, I want you to think about that because it's very easy to yell, oh, fraud, fraud and fake news. And, and, and it's in a way it's juicy and funny, but in the, in reality, it's not, these are very, uh, yeah, very um, horrible stories sometimes. And I, I, I want to point it out and I'm trying to always be aware of that. Um, we can also talk about publications and productivity and uh, maybe we focus too much on scientific publications as, an out, as the output of what we do. And are there ways where we can measure our output in different ways that we can not focus so much on how many publications somebody has and in which papers, which impact factors, can we measure science um, productivity in a different way? And can we maybe also focus more on negative results? Because one person can spend years of their lives and only having negative results, and that might be worth publishing, but it's hard to publish such results in journals. Um, we can think about which or whose role is it to detect science misconduct? Is it uh, the, peer, the peer reviewer who might not be trained to find these things? Is it maybe people who uh, work at, uh, at journals, at uh, you know, staff, at the publisher, for example? Those people might be more trained. Um, is it their role to detect these things? And uh, some journals and publishers have already taken steps to hire people who are specialized uh, in finding these um, types of photo duplications, for example. And there have been people who are uh, more trained in, in making the requirements for uh, submitting a manuscript uh, in a better way. Um, and then uh, conflicts of interest are always very important and not to be avoided. And in the end, um, the question is, is science broken or not? So like I said already at the beginning of this slide, I firmly believe in science and I don't want the message of this talk to be that all science is broken. 
science has its flaws, but I firmly believe in science. And I, I, I hope you're convinced that there's people fighting this fight with me, not just me, there's many people who are concerned about misconduct and who want to fight it and who want to change some of, some of the ways that these cases are handled. And I hope um, with that, we can make a difference to science. So with that, I thank you. And uh, I don't think there's any way of people can, who can ask questions to me. I'm on Twitter, Microbiome Digest um, without an E. Um, and I have several blogs and you can ask me questions. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Elizabeth. Um, this is Ben. Um, thank you very much for fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. I'm just going to look through um, Twitter and see and Facebook and see if we have any questions through the live stream. Um, and I also have a lot of questions written down. If you have time to to discuss them a little bit, is that okay? I have time. I know I don't think there's a somebody scheduled after me, but I wasn't quite sure if there was. A... The, if the gap had been filled, I, I have I have a whole hour that I can talk to you. Okay, great. Because we have until now, we have fifteen minutes basically uh, oh, okay. in the schedule for for this. So um, that's that's great if we can can take advantage of your expertise and all the incredibly important work that you've done. Um, yeah, one thing I wrote down uh, kind of way through the the talk is kind of you know what what is the damage do you think um you know in some in your position who has been really digging kind of looking into this uh and someone like me who has been involved in science and research and, and maybe doesn't know the extent to this and i'm kind of thinking specifically you know if i want to go and do a lit review or i want to go and do an experiment i go and um, pick a random paper you know should i be scrutinizing it in the way that you are or is is it not as bad as that you know what is there is there any way you can kind of uh say what the damage might be to the system that we have uh so i there is no way i would be able to express that in 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 amounts of money i can just i can only think it must be enormous because there's so much money that goes on in science not just in academia but also in in industry and i've worked in both um, uh, there's damage in the the amount of uh, grand money and and just time and effort and kits that somebody you know uses and, and, and tips of pipette tips, but just the blood, sweat, and tears that all of us spend in the lab trying to replicate somebody else's results. Um, it's hard to measure that, um, but it it must be enormous. Uh, that is one cost, and then there's the cost for if, if I think about the cost that a paper such as the Wakefield paper, the, the mm -hmm. Lancet paper that got retracted um, after fabricating results and, and people still believing that that paper is true uh, and that vaccines cause autism, the damage that that has done, in my opinion, and I, I realize there's you know other opinions about this, but in my opinion, that is enormous because that might have involved lives of children who could have been vaccinated against measles, but have lost their lives. And now with the vaccine discussion on HPV, where the amount of people who claim that HPV vaccines are causing um, people to be paralyzed or sterile, or uh, I've, I've heard all kinds of horrible stories, um, that could lead in the end to, to women and also men, well, not women. Uh, so women will get uh, cervical cancer, but men can get from HPV, can get anal cancer or throat cancer, for example. There's all kinds of nasty cancer that you could have prevented with a vaccine. So the price of that is is beyond measure. Like what is the price of a human life? I I have no idea, but it's it's enormous. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um... Yes, yeah, a very, very uh, difficult, difficult question, a very, very difficult subject, but it's clearly important to address. And I think, you know, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, Trump uh, endorsing um, that publication. And then we have, you right. know, we, we talk a lot as scientists about the media and the press about the, the fake uh, news and the, the problem with, uh, with fake information. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, 
where where this fits in and maybe what we could do to be proactive uh, about that because obviously it feels like there's a few different ways of um, that this could could harm science you know like people it's easy to kind of look at science like being um, kind of having these problems and saying like none of it's uh, reliable and then you could have scientists potentially being too defensive and defending science not owning up and not acknowledging problems so it's it's very complicated but what is your perspective and your point of view on how we can maybe be proactive in this environment i would say that a year ago i was fairly optimistic and i was sort of the opinion like you know we scientists we know what we're doing trust us and and uh there's a couple of people with different opinions and that's fine but they're not really harmful but i'm a little bit more pessimistic uh today because i think we have seen several countries with leaders who have no longer uh, supported science. And of course, I live in the US normally, not, not, not right now, but normally I'm in the US and I uh, have been with many others so disappointed in how science is now being dismissed. And not just that, but how, how we're moving towards uh, being less polite on the internet or to each other, where it seems to be now the new normal that it's totally fine to call each other an idiot. And um, I, you know, it's it's hard to to remain polite and to be in a discussion when somebody just calls you an idiot or or even worse, a retard. I've been called many things on Twitter, and it hurts. Uh, I cannot deny that. I you know you you sort of try to pretend, and everybody says, "Oh, just move on." Uh, but you, when you try to fight this information, you it's it's not an honest discussion. Like you know it it this. I tried to, you know, my scientific arguments, but the, it seems that most of the other, the people who are convinced that it's, it's different, they don't listen to arguments. They just immediately slap you in the face with um, a, an insult. And so these, these discussions are not very fruitful. And uh, I have less and less hope that we can convince people like that. And, and some of these people are very influential and it's apparently totally fine on social media because the moderators don't really seem to care. Uh, it's, they, accept, they find it acceptable that people call each other idiots. And um, yeah, it's, it's just hard because that's not, a, that's not an honest discussion anymore. It's just uh, throwing names and I don't know, maybe I'm very pessimistic because that happened this week to me. I've, you know, lots of trolls and it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's harder and harder to go into a fruitful discussion with uh, people who don't believe in science. Yes, no, I, I understand and they're always there, I suppose. So I suppose you use uh, Twitter and social media for the, the positive things, which presumably are that you can get this kind of information spread very, very quickly as well to people who care about it. Like I've seen your work on this and I haven't engaged so much, but it's definitely made me think uh, a lot about it so is that why you use social media in spite of the fact that it's um, you know you kind of risk kind of being targeted by these trolls um, yeah I mean on the other hand social media has many good things so uh, mm. uh, the, the the trolls are bad but there's also uh, lots of I, f I feel the scientific community is so wonderful it's diverse it's open to lots of ideas it's exchanging practical tips it's cat cat pictures did i mention cat pictures um mm -hmm. stuff like that is it's just it warms your heart and 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 you see signs like the moment it comes out it's you know the paper is still warm and you can already read it. it it's fantastic it has so many good things and then of course the trolls are bad as long as you stick to the circle of signs it's fairly fine but if you move outside and and engage with non-scientists it can be sometimes very nasty uh, and sometimes very rewarding also but uh, it, it's very dependent on which circle you're in and i i try to stay in my in that science circle as much as possible even though i want to make sure it's diverse and representative of uh, all types of voices but it can be very uh, unpleasant outside of that i have some questions but i just want to pick up on your last point in my sure. old job working at the science media center we would often face lots of uh, antagonistic 
insults from people who were from outside of uh, mainstream science and had particular opinions about things like perhaps vaccines or you know certain diseases or certain treatments for diseases and they didn't like the currently accepted treatments and so they you know really really didn't like anyone who was advocating the science for any of these things and then it would get very personal so it's yeah it's a, certainly a thing that i've experienced as well right. but my question for you actually was uh, in your talk we had a look at all of these examples of falsified data mostly images or mostly doctored images or doctored western blots that kind of thing with the advent of you know widespread coding and you know people able to just train ais and so on and, and take a more data focused approach is there a risk that people can falsify like you know data sets to a point where and I, um, you know they can they can come to conclusions erroneously and falsely and, and is that harder to detect because you know our human eyes are really good at detecting visual irregularity mm -hmm. we're not so good at looking at giant spreadsheets of of numbers and working out if it's a real data set or not. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that development. Yeah, and, and uh, the answer is, I think that happens in all types of science. And um, if I can spot it in photos where it's relatively, you know, it's, it's somebody left a trace. I can see the photo clearly. I can draw my little colored boxes and everybody's like, duh, that is Photoshop. Um, it's very obvious. But yeah, like you said, if there's a data set of uh, 1 million uh, reads from a sequencer, who's, who's checking that? There's, I certainly, if I pre-review a paper, I, didn't, I never download those data sets. I don't even know how to download from, uh, uh, you know, pop, pop uh, no, not pop, but the N NCBI uh, SRA file. I have no idea how to open that or do that. So I don't look at these large data sets as a peer reviewer and I, imagine that not everybody would do that uh, as well. And so it must be relatively easy to A, cheat and to not be detected. And uh, so I imagine that that happens fairly often, but I have no idea about the frequency. So I don't know, but I worry about it. And I uh, also worry like the uh, paper mill that I pointed out where these, you have these artificially generated bands in that case, they made the mistake of having the same background, so we could easily recognize them. I'm convinced that the paper mill folks are like, oh, we should also do something, uh, you know, have some artificial intelligence making a background that looks different every time. And that's, if you can make fake bands, you can make fake backgrounds. So how can we ever recognize these things? Uh, we can only recognize them when, we, when they make a mistake and we can then catch them but mm. it must happen a lot. And I'm very worried about paper mills uh, in particular because the individual fraudster usually will make a mistake, but these professional fraudsters are really scary. And I think as data detectives, even though we might use uh, bioinformatics ourselves to find these things, we will always be one step uh, behind what the fraudsters are doing. Mm. And there's no real systematic way in which science hunts for these things other than the peer review system uh no the peer review system doesn't hunt for it i feel the only hunters are people like me yeah i mean so right. what i mean is yeah the peer review yeah, right your, your um, approach is, is unique in the fact that it's not part of the system do you know what i mean it's not like there's a right you know ubiquitous way in which science looks for false data we look for you know, perhaps experiments that weren't done to the best possible standard, but there isn't the same kind of correction system for falsifying data. There, so journals or publishers in general are starting now to be more aware and to, to scan for these things. So you see more and more journals that have more rigorous uh, guidelines for submitting figures, for example. So they will say splicing is not allowed and you know these and these and these things are not allowed sometimes you have to spell it out specifically you are not allowed to slap a rectangle over a band you don't want to see not allowed just the band has to be there you can play with the contrast you can make it lighter or darker but you still need to see background features and you cannot have oversaturated bands you can have very specific rules for those type of things um, and now more and more will also ask for things like did you outsource any of your experiments because that is now being used as an excuse where 
the author will say, oh, we have no idea what happened to this Western blot. We actually asked the friendly laboratory to do this experiment for us and we didn't do it ourselves. So we're not to blame. And they're like, and we're like, well, if you did, if you outsource it, you should have mentioned that. But then if the journal doesn't specify it. So there's more stricter and stricter rules trying to catch or to at least make it harder for fraudsters to do these things. Uh, but it's still not enough. And journals just are very slow in responding. It's like changing a big cruise ship. You know, it doesn't change very quickly yeah, in its direction. To to them, to, I know. To it's work. like it's. I've been doing this for years, so I know I'm still not, you know, the, the ship is still turning, but it, we're getting there. I do feel publishers are starting to listen to what people like I'm saying, and they're starting to take us seriously because I'm not going to go away. Um, I've been doing this for almost seven years now, and you just have to be very patient in this business for sure. Well, very grateful that you and people like you are helping to res preserve research integrity and hopefully increase our research integrity. So thank you very much for this talk. Ben, did You're you have welcome. any more questions before we run out of time? Uh, I've got a ton of questions here actually, but I don't think we have, uh, we have time. I mean, um, yeah, it was, it was great uh, to hear from you in, in person. I think like everyone else, we should uh, interact with you on Twitter. Is that the best place to get in touch with you? Elizabeth. Usually, uh, there are, uh, so yeah, I'm at microbiome digest. Um, so it's microbiome without an E at the end. <laughs> it's, it's because Twitter does <laughs> microbiome digest. That's my <laughs> handle. Yeah. Or search for Elizabeth Big. If you, if you scroll, if you hover over my name, that's actually my name. And there's, as far as I know, nobody else with that name on Twitter. So cool. uh, luckily I got a very unique name so you can find me. Nice. And uh, yeah, we are following you. So you could also hunt through the Yay. FEMS followers yes. or people that FEMS are following as well. So a few ways to find you online. Sure. Great. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for, for having me here. It was my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm going to listen to a couple more talks before I go to bed. Awesome. Yeah, we can't Great. wait. To thank you. It's going to go up online as well eventually so people can review it and watch it again. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.